Welcome in. I'm Colette Wheeland alongside Dr. Stephen Camerata. Steve is the author of Late Talking Children, A Symptom or a Stage, a book that is now in its second edition. And something we, you talk about, I say we talk about in the book, you talk about it. We're just going to talk about it here. <laughs> Late talkers in general have some characteristics in common. And there's a special category of late talking children that you talk about who have their own special characteristics. So who are those kids? So that's called the Einstein syndrome. And that was first coined by Dr. Thomas Sowell, who actually wrote a whole book on Einstein syndrome. And actually some of the data we collected are in that book. Um, so in a, in a fundamental way, um, the Einstein syndrome is named after Einstein who allegedly was a late talker, but obviously was very gifted in physics and mathematics. And so uh, a late talker um, who has a precocious analytical ability, mathematical ability, oftentimes um, that'll trade off. So they talk late, but then they have this real strength and thinking ability. And that's how we define Einstein syndrome. And real quick, what, what percentage are we talking about late talkers? Small, large? Very small. Yes, okay. it's not usual. I, I love it. Parents write to me or email me and They'll, they'll say, oh, you know, my child's brilliant, and I love that. I, I think every child's brilliant. Um, but I do want to point out that the Einstein syndrome is actually a bit rare. Um, we actually know a lot about um, the development of mathematically precocious children. Um, some of my colleagues here at Vanderbilt, um, David Lubinsky and Camilla Bembo, have a longitudinal study where they followed mathematically precocious children from the time they are in preschool into their middle age. So we really know how they develop and what kinds of traits and strengths and weaknesses these people have. When do you start typically noticing these traits? Is it an early age? So we'll notice uh, really even as toddlers, um, the children are showing um, a real interest in problem solving. Um, they tend to be escape artists, so they can <laughs> pick any childproof <laughs> lock you put in for them. Um, sometimes I have parents tell me that they can't open a childproof bottle, so they hand it to their, their preschooler, <laughs> their Einstein syndrome right. preschooler to open it for them. And so um, they're, they're really good at, at thinking um, and problem solving, and they are very fascinated, um, usually with mathematics and quantity. And they seem to have an instinctive knowledge of quantity. Even at an early age, um, they'll know how to count coins and things like that. And it's something where it's not just a rote skill. They're actually thinking about it and engaging it. And they're just way ahead in math is one of the key traits. Math, that's one of the M's. What are the other two M's right. that are typically so the, associated with late So this talkers? is generally true for all late talkers, but it's particularly true in Einstein syndrome. So there's math, which I mentioned, um, and then there's music. Many of our late talkers are precocious in music. And um, I talk about it in the book, and also Dr. Soul talks about it in his book on Einstein syndrome, that some famous late talkers um, are concert pianists or conductors, and they're their um, insistence on mastering a topic, which is also a, a key for late talkers, but especially Einstein syndrome, makes them really focused on music and they end up being good musicians. And then the third is this um, memory, visual memory in particular. Um, uh, late talking children that have Einstein syndrome and late talking children generally, they often can remember where things are. I have parents tell me, you know, I lose my keys and then my, my little GPS, you know, late talker goes and finds <laughs> the keys and brings them to me when I say keys. And so, um, I'll certainly say this is true for me too as a late talker that oftentimes I can visualize things or remember things. It's not really a photographic memory per se, but that visual reasoning is a real scaffold for verbal. And that's usually the opposite in most people. So that's an unusual trait of late talkers, but particular Einstein syndrome. And um, if you read um, Einstein's theory of relativity, he has these wonderful examples, for example, uh, like a train to explain what he does. And so he, he's visualizing these concepts and and then, um, you know, he's able to communicate them in that way, but it's really clear he's using his visual memory as opposed to the verbal or auditory. And that's clear even in his own writing. Okay, you're talking about the the early age. These, these children can't talk, but right. you can still somehow test them or give them an IQ. So describe what an, a nonverbal IQ test look like, looks like. I'm really glad you asked that question because one of the things that happens is that many times we have late talking uh, children that are assessed using a verbal uh, measure of intelligence. So people ask them questions. They might ask them to name objects, things like that, which is related to intelligence to be sure. But for late talkers, it's not a good way to test their intelligence. So there's tests that were developed for deaf children and there's also tests that were developed for um, in international or, um, uh, ESL, English as second language people where you have very minimal or no talking and they're puzzles, they're problem solving, they're sequences 
And that we have a whole series of tests that, that, that um, tap that. And you absolutely, for any late talker, want to insist on that. You can do that usually. So there's checklists when there are two, and you can sometimes observe that. But really, when they get to be three or four, you can absolutely test that in some depth and know whether they actually are in the typical range or advanced, or they're struggling a little bit with more general learning. And you can do that, but you have to have a nonverbal um, intelligence test to do that. And that's really important. Well, walk me through that. All right. Let's say I show up at your door right. and I'm like, hey, you know, Steve, can we test my child? What, what is the first thing we're going to do? So it depends on how old the child is. Okay. Um, so if they're if they're a toddler, I'm gonna um, actually I'm, ahead of time I'm gonna have the parents send me a video of them interacting with the child in their home environment because they may not necessarily act the same way sure. during in an office. I mean, you know, um, actually they all kind of see me as grandpa, so they mostly like me. <laughs> but you know, um, I have a tie on, and you know, that might, might be scary to them, or they might come to an office. It looks like a doctor's office where they got a shot or something, and so. Right. Um, I want to know kind of what's happening at home. But um, I'm going to try then to really engage them in things that toddlers normally do. So different kinds of toddler toys. And um, I'll also kind of watch how the parent interacts with them. Not to criticize the parent, but to know how the social interaction is going. And, and then I'll actually do specific things with specific kinds of toys. Like one of the things, um, one of the tests I'll do, I have a, I have a toy that has a, um, a little bear inside that's kind of cute in it. They have to figure out how to open the box to get to the bear, and I can kind of watch their problem solving through that. Okay. And then when they're a little older, um, we might do different repeated patterns. Like we might be something like blue, yellow, blue, yellow, um, and then you add you know more and more complicated kinds of things. It might be looking at it's kind of like a glorified Where's Waldo, so they have to find like a little um, figure from a visual array. Um, it might be looking at um, like uh, pictures where they're like a puzzle where they're in pieces and have to put them together things like that. And you can do that with very few words. And in fact, I, I also do research and support people with cochlear implants, deaf children. And it, you really have to do that with them because their auditory input is weak. And so if you're testing them, I mean, historically, people completely underestimated the potential of children with hearing loss because of this. So um, anyway, the children with Einstein syndrome will be able to do those kinds of tasks way better than other children their age. So all these tests are, are norm. That is their you test a bunch of different children at that age level and you kind of see if this child's really above age level. And um, really, um, with some limited exceptions, all they talking children are usually better at that than they are with their speaking. Because that's uh, where their focus is, right? That's where their where focus their is, is, but also, again, if you think of it, this is a trade-off, um, they're really going with the visual spatial and learning that and solving that where all other children are learning how to talk. and. That's one of the reasons that it takes them longer because they're spending their developmental time with the visual spatial, the thinking ability and so on. And they're spending less time, if you will, on this, less neural resources on the talking. So they're, they're just different than other children, but um, it's actually not necessarily anything that's bad. And in fact, these children tend to go into fields like engineering or some of them might go into music or some of them might go into math and things like that. So they end up having a really um, good path forward, but when they're little, it's really noticeable. Since so much of our education and treatment is focused on talking and listening, they really stand out as having challenges. What percentage of late talking children are exceptionally bright? Um, so I, I'm going to say all of them, um, but it, it's basically if you for almost all, almost all, say over ninety percent, um, they're going to be better at some things than other children at their age. It's just it's going to be things like problem solving. Even, even children where the late talking is a symptom, they may be very interested in numbers and letters, and they may be able to read words, for example, but they don't necessarily comprehend them, but they're gonna have strengths that are ahead. But if your question is, these children that are really have this foundational long-term life, lifelong skill at mathematics or physics or things like that, it's pretty rare to have the, that kind of precociousness. Those who truly fit into the category of an Einstein right, syndrome. Right, it's not very common. Okay. We do see it, you know, but, but it's not super common. For this, this group of, of children, is there a common age when these children, these specific late talkers start talking? Um, so usually they don't start talking until they're three or a little older. And I don't know, that's basically anecdotal. Like uh, uh, the physicist uh, uh, Teller, uh, who was um, part of the project that gave us the atom bomb, which I guess in a way is not a very positive thing, but he was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. and. Uh, he didn't start talking till he was three. And um, um, uh, Einstein, of course, is another one. And 
So that seems to be kind of a magic age. They tend not to talk when they're two. A lot of late talkers start talking when they're two or two and a half. But again, these are just based on diaries, so we don't have good prospective studies. So I'm I'm giving you that answer based on anecdotes and well, diaries. That's, why aren't there more studies done for this subset of late talkers? Well, what happens is that um, we have a culture where we want to do early intervention, and I'm all in favor of early intervention. So we don't really have what we call natural history. So the way you do this scientifically is you'd get, you know, a handful of a hundred lay talkers, and then you just kind of watch how they develop and you test them systematically and you see what percentage have Einstein syndrome and when they start talking and so on. But, you know, what's going to happen now is that toddler is going to be identified by child find or something like that and put into services. And so it's going to kind of change the developmental course. We don't really know what's called the natural history and um, in a way, I'm not sure we could even do that study um, in, in modern America. Or I think if you went to countries that didn't have as many support services, you, you, you could do something like that. But, you know, we wouldn't want to do that per se. So it's one of those questions where I just don't think we're going to have a scientifically based answer. With, with some of the studies that have been done, what do we know from, from those studies? So we know that um, there are certainly children, and again, from these longitudinal mathematical precocious studies, we know there's certain traits that predict mathematical precocity and that there's going to be certain career tracks, uh, certain social types of things um, that really um, come out of that. Um, so we also know that we can test for this kind of giftedness um, really in preschool and have a pretty good sense of if they're really advanced in these areas. And that, that um, precociousness actually does tend to persist when they actually – so, so, like I said, some children can do world learning types of things, and that's not necessarily what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being able to, like, say no numbers, but then to kind of do um, addition of subtraction when they're young, or like one one little guy. Um, well, a little guy he's an adult now, but <laughs> he he became an engineer, and he could do um, fractions, he could do decimals when he was in kindergarten, you know. So he and he was a lay talker, and so he was. He's able to do these mathematical things and you give him different problems and, and he's clearly advanced and he clearly actually knows the concepts. They're not just not rote learning. They're not just like an echolalia where are spitting back things. He's actually thinking about the problems that can solve them. And that's what we're talking about here. We do know that uh, often you see a close relative and we've talked about this before, but uh, either in an analytical or a musical uh, profession, right? So we, we can say with some certainty from the tests or the the studies that mm -hmm. have been done right that those children t tend to fall in that sort of familial line so it's true so um there's a certain increased probability of um, being late talking and if you have a primary or secondary relative that's late talking so you know i'm late talking according to my mom and then my son one of my sons is late talking and then if you do these kind of um they're like population studies um, they're not experimental per se but um, you just do surveys, for example, like Dr. Soule did in the book, The Einstein Syndrome. And you say, okay, um, in the general population, there's you know a certain X probability someone's going to be an engineer, someone's going to have a mathematical, uh, they're going to have a musical relative, uh, a relative who makes their living in music or whatever it is. And those probabilities tend to be higher in late talking children. And, and certainly in Einstein Syndrome, we see that there's usually a first or second order relative who's you know, uh, really accomplished mathematician or who's working, you know, who got, who's working for NASA as an engineer or something like that. They're clearly high achieving. And so there's clearly a familial relation with that. Or, um, and just based, again, on odds of that, those occurring in the population, there's a higher probability in the late talker. Is there anyone out there currently trying to follow these children into adulthood? Yeah, so um, what happens now is that um, people will have like a certain – diagnosis and they'll follow it up. So we have longitudinal studies of autism, for example. We have um, the, the longitudinal studies of language disorder. Um, Leslie Suscorla, um, a colleague who's at Bryn Mawr, psychologist, she studied um, kids with expressive language delay, which is a kind of late talking from the time they were toddlers until they reached adulthood. So there's that kind of thing. But just like a longitudinal studies of Einstein syndrome, with the exception of that study I mentioned or that group I mentioned, this whole series of studies, for mathematically precocious, we don't really have anything like that. But um, you know, certainly we have long-term studies. We also have retrospective studies where we see gifted people and we kind of can look back at their educational testing and things like that and kind of see how it unfolded. I think you wrote something to the effect that Einstein early on was thought to have intellectual disabilities. Mm -hmm. 
purely because he wasn't talking, right? So giving a child child that kind of label, what consequences could that have later on in life? Yeah, for them? so that it's really a problem um, if a child's mislabeled, and so. Um, yeah, actually, I think it's really funny. So uh, one of the things I like to talk about is when I signed up, um, applied to college, um, initially he was denied. How would you like to be the college administrator <laughs> who didn't admit <laughs> Einstein into your college? And the reason that was written on there, if I remember correctly, is that um, although he hey, this guy's really good in math and science, he's not so hot in the social studies. You know, I'm paraphrasing, but I just think interesting, you know, because, you know, who rejected Einstein from, from college? But um Basically, um, so one of the ways we might get intelligence in a preschool is we might have them um, point to pictures or name pictures. And that is, in fact, one predictor of intelligence. But in a late talker, they're not going to be able to do that. So you'd say, okay, you know, they're, gosh, you know, they're way behind. They can't name these pictures. There must be something wrong with their, their intellectual ability, their thinking, you know. And so when you tie it to language like that, the late talkers are going to really be underestimated in terms of their potential. And so, um, you know, that's, that's a huge problem. And, um, it, yeah, it's, it's, and you might say, well, what does it matter? You know, they can go into these classrooms that are slower, but the reality is that, um, those classrooms are great for children who learn more slowly and, and we need to accommodate that. So for example, one of the things I work with is down syndrome on average, they tend to learn more slowly and we want to really scaffold them. And in a way we want to use their valuable learning time to its maximal effect, but a late talker who doesn't have intellectual disability or what we used to call mental retardation who's in that, they're not going to have opportunities to learn. And so it's going to slow down their learning dramatically and really it's going to stunt their intellectual to grow. So it's really important that we get a good assessment. And if someone says your child's intellectually disabled, someone says your child has mental retardation, we don't use that anymore, but sometimes it still comes up. Um, you want to ask them, you know, why, and you definitely don't want to accept that unless you're really sure it's true. And it, it, it exists. I'm not saying it doesn't, and, and we know how to deal with that. But there's just so many times when the, the children are misunderstood because they've used an intellectual test. The example I like to use is if, um, you know, I went to Germany and I was in preschool, even as an adult, and they gave me um, an intelligence test in German, I would come out as pretty severely intellectual disabled because I don't understand German. And that's really the same thing that's happening. So I did want to mention uh, an important um, kind of checklist for Einstein syndrome. So um, in Einstein syndrome, one of the things that's uh, really important is that um, they not only have this ability to um, do these puzzles and problem solve, but they also have really good language comprehension. So they understand what's, what is being said to them. And so it's not that they have this general language deficit, it's that it's really the expressive side of things. So they, they do have good thinking ability and it does extend to understanding language, but it's really the expressive side of it that they're low. Um, another trait that I like to highlight is um, Winston Churchill was also a late talker, again, based on his book and so on, but um, I'm gonna paraphrase. Um, late talkers don't necessarily comply with how teachers want to teach them, particularly in the early years. And so um, the quote, and I'm paraphrasing, is um, my teachers um, had a, um, a reservoir of compulsion, but I had an inexhaustible supply of resistance. <laughs> and so, you know, he wrote in, in his uh, diary or his uh, biography, you know, he talked about how the teachers knew he was smart, but he just wouldn't perform on demand. And that's that's a very common thing, very common in Einstein syndrome and very common in late talkers in general. They're not necessarily going to do something because you want them to do it. They're going to have to want to do it. Well, that, that can be its own challenge. That leads me to my next question. Why do schools so often struggle to help these kids? So schools are really designed to um, teach kind of the average kid that comes in the door. And that's, you know, they should be that. That's the majority of who they're going to going to. Uh, um, serve. And so most of the teaching that happens, I, I call it, you know, sit still and listen, which is probably a little bit pejorative. And teachers are wonderful. No teacher should hear this as being negative. Um, but, you know, primarily when they, when they sit down in a circle time and they read a story, the children are going to sit there and listen and learn from it. The late talker is going to be over, um, you know, by the center that has the puzzles and they're just not gonna sit still and listen. It's just not how they learn. And what I talk about is show and tell. So there's really a mismatch between, you know, how the how the late talker learns and how the Einstein ch child learns 
and you know how the information is being presented. And that's especially true in preschool and early school age, which is really more through recitation and really this reasonable way of approaching it that just doesn't match a late talker's learning. Um, I mentioned earlier this young man who could do fractions and decimals and things uh, when he was in kindergarten. When he was in third grade, I got this call from the family saying, oh, you know, he's, he's being considered for behavior disorder. And this little guy is, you know, he was really mild mannered. I mean, we do deal with late talkers who have behavioral challenges as well, not him. I'm like, why is that? Well, they were trying to teach him times tables in third grade and they were trying to teach him, you know, simple division. Well, he mastered that three years ago. Yeah. So when they were trying to force him to do that and comply, he just absolutely resisted it, kind of like Churchill. And so the, the, and this is really, I think, insightful. I said to the teachers, I said, look, you know, just let him work ahead. Let him, he was actually at that point, he probably should have been doing geometry because he really liked shapes and could kind of reason through that. And they said, you know what? We just can't let him do that. He has to be with this curriculum that we have for third grade. And so, you know, we ended up having to change schools and so on and get him into a program where he could work ahead at his skill level. The other thing is, um, it's not unusual for a lay talker or even an Einstein syndrome child to be advanced say, in math and science but maybe to be behind like Einstein was in social studies. And so in the same classroom, part of the day, they're way ahead, part of the day, they're way behind. Sure. So that sweet spot of where they need to be and meeting them where they are developmentally, which we should do with all children, really, if you think about it, it's really accentuated in late talkers and really accentuated in Einstein syndrome kids. So speaking directly to the parents, what should parents of the chi of these children, these Einstein syndrome, late talking children, right. what should they be doing to make sure that their child is given every opportunity to reach their potential? Because I think the worst thing that could happen is that they get discouraged and, you know, give up. Yeah. And that's so important because you, um, the children can learn that they're losers in the academic arena and get turned off to school. Yeah. So we really want to be encouraging. So the most important advice I can give is let them work ahead to their skill level. Don't hold them back. You know, if, if, that, if, that, if that little uh, preschooler is ready to learn, um, you know, their times tables, let them go ahead. Um, we have uh, some brothers that are mathematically uh, gifted who we've been working with for a long time. And, you know, they, I would talk to them about calculus when they were, kind of in early middle school. And so, um, you know, they were just ready for that. And their parents were great about just letting them work ahead. Now I'll also point out that when children um, have this kind of precocity, it sometimes can manifest itself also in social differences because most of their peers aren't really that interested in calculus when they're in middle school. I mean, most people walking around aren't that interested in calculus. I, I like calculus, but it's not for everybody. Um, and so um, it's also uh, important to understand that um, they're going to be seeking other people who have their same interests. And it's not necessarily a social impairment. It's just that they're, they're interested in thinking in different ways. Like uh, Dr. Soul talks about his late talking son and how he liked chess. And so he sought out friends that were chess. He was fantastic in chess, could win chess matches when he was in, in grade school and, you know, was really good at that. And so, you know, he had that, that particular analytical ability. So um, what's the most important thing is don't let the schools hold them back. Let them work ahead to their skill level. Um, and also for things they need more time, give them more time. So we want to meet them where they are, but don't hold them back. You know, and the, the longitudinal study I mentioned about mathematic precocious, that's one of the strongest lessons. We just want them a lot of work ahead. And by the way, that doesn't mean having them do more worksheets. Okay? <laughs> it doesn't mean, oh, they're gifted, so they're going to do 50 worksheets on times tables instead of the normal 10. It's really letting them go ahead to geometry when they're ready and so on and so forth. So let them work ahead. And if they're interested in physics, whatever it is, nurture that and encourage it. Is there anything else you, you want to uh, say to the parents? And any other advice, anything else they should be doing? Yeah, the most important advice, and this is true for not only Einstein syndrome, but there's going to be differences in all late talkers. And so it's really important that parents do their best to set aside comparing their children to other children, because um, obviously their talking is going to be behind. And you're going to see um, children engaging in peer play. You're going to see children sitting in the circle time and, you know, going along and chanting, and that's all wonderful, but it's really important not to push the panic button and just to see their child as an individual, be happy about their gifts um, there's a, uh, one of the people in, um, in Dr. Soul's Einstein syndrome is a musician and he ended up being a, like a world renowned concert pianist and his parents tried to get him to do the violin when he was five years old. He 
destroyed the violin. He broke it. <laughs> I mean, you know, so um, if the parents were like trying to force that, you know, that wouldn't have been good and probably would have de derailed his career as an amazing concert pianist. So the point here is that we, we have to teach the late talker to fit into the world around him. I'm not saying anything goes, but we also want to meet the child where they are and really be excited and happy about the child that's in front of us as opposed to the child we we think they should be or a child that fits in with everyone around them. Late talkers are going to have some differences that are not only happening in that moment, but really carry forward throughout their life. I love those words. You know, celebrate the child right now. The, the, that's Always. before you. I, I think that applies to every parent. It does. And be really proud and happy about the Einstein syndrome child and what they can do. And don't think of it as a red flag. Think of it as a green flag. That's really awesome, you know, and be happy with that and understand that there's trade-offs. So if they're really good at that, they may not be so good at some other things. And that's just normal, natural. Thank you, Steve. All great advice. We're going to continue the conversation next week in our podcast. We're going to talk about the importance of getting a proper diagnosis and how to make sure your child is actually getting one. So that's going to come up next week. In the meantime, we want to hear from you. Ask us a question in the comment section. Be sure to click subscribe and hit the bell. And you can always check out the Late Talkers Foundation website. And always remember, the best thing for your child is you. <laughs>